languages in multilingual contexts. So whether you have this language policy that is fully written out as in several countries or you have this understanding of what the language policy is in the statements made occasionally by the government and by what the government actually does as is the case with Pakistan. Languages in multilingual contexts do have an effect on the individuals who live in that context and it becomes a socio-political issue. So language repertoire, that is the collection of the languages that you know, your language competency in certain languages and the choice that you make to use one language rather than the other defines relationships of power. So languages with religion and culture also become a symbol of national identity. And let me remind you um, that several times and in several countries at times you try to change the script as we did with Urdu and we try to take out certain Sanskrit words even from Bengali, replace them with Arabic terminology, Persian terminology, so that it became, it somehow would align more with the culture of, of Pakistan and this Muslim identity that we wanted to take forward in uh, this context. Even at individual level, when you speak in English or you speak in Urdu or you speak in Punjabi, the choice is never random, although it might be subconscious. So somehow, when you use um, a one language rather than the other, it has a um, uh, has an impact. And we will come to some examples from Pakistan to illustrate that point. Remember the choice of the language that is spoken reveals the social background, but it also at times conceals the social background. It is also um, used to project a kind of identity that you would like to negotiate with a new group. And it is all about affiliation with a, what we call an imagined community. So at societal level, whenever what they call um, diglossic bilingualism, um, what happens is that different functions are allocated to different languages. However, this leads to valorization of these languages, that is, it adds value to those languages, for instance, that are used in education. And when your educational institutions, for instance, ask the students not to use that language or, uh, or original language in schools at all, then they are delegitimizing the use of that language and they are devaluing the language of uh, though that community. So linguistic hierarchy and social hierarchy feed into each other. So they are, uh, they, they live in this dialectical relationship. They, each of them reinforces the other. So if the social hierarchy will change, your linguistic hierarchy in your language policy whether it is written or not written, will also change. So language is a tool of symbolic power. And if you come to these examples of Pakistan, for instance, I clearly remember, I'll give you just two examples, which I remember from my uh, experience. And I'm sure you can come up with several examples yourself. Working at Al Khan, in my off, uh, going to my office, I realized I had left my keys at home. We had this uh, watchman who had the keys to my office. I called him up and I asked him to come over and open the office in Urdu. 
And this person had this whole tirade of saying, why had I left the keys? I should remember it. The person will take some time and he will be there in like, you know, quite some time. We can't locate him and everything. What happened interestingly is the very next day, I forgot the keys of my office again and I dreaded to call the same watchman again. But this time, I spoke to him in English and said, could I please have the keys to my office or could I have my office opened? And all that the person said was, yes, Dr. It's the, the, the person is on his way. I'll just locate the person and send him right away. So by this switching of language, and I'm sure you have done it something like that at a different point in your life, you impose that kind of symbolic power, you impose or clarify the status different, which is sad at times, but we all do it. Similarly, in, in my research, very clearly, children who could not speak in um, uh, could not speak in uh, English very well in colleges and universities, they felt that they were of a lower level. It's very interesting that they accepted as if they were the people or the students who were speaking in English were better than them, although they were not. So these were the examples of Pakistan, and I'm sure you live through them every day. However, having said that, please remember that this is an evolving state. We, as you know, together, the change is there. This hierarchy can change. The social, so, uh, um, uh, the social status can change between groups, and the linguistic hierarchy changes along with it. The functions, when they are clearly uh, sort of distributed across languages, it is said that languages then somehow different languages complement each other. However, whenever there is a competition for power in certain languages, functions are not described very clearly, like the problem created by this national and official language difference, then the competition leads to a language shift. And we have seen it sadly how people now leave their language original languages and try to use more and more Urdu. And do you leave Urdu and more use more and more? Uh, English language in Pakistani context.